This is the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. Hello, everybody. This is Trevor. Supposing that Paul... Paul, how are you doing today? Doing well. Doing well. We're back in our old morning time slot, so I have my old friend coffee next to me again. I'm feeling a little more confident, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> and I well. feel groggy, which I guess makes me feel confident, so... Yeah, that's right. So we're back where we should be. There we are. Well, listeners, we are excited to, to be here today. Uh, for one thing, we have a winner to announce later on of the Archipelago giveaway. Um, we'll be doing that here shortly, and we'll make sure that it's loud and clear and announced. But, you know, I, I really can't wait to see who's going to get that one-year standard membership to Archipelago, Paul. <laughs> I know, I can't either. I'm, I'd be jealous if I didn't have one myself. But yeah, I, I really appreciate everybody sending in their their thoughts. We got some really great entries, and you can tell that everybody else out there is as excited as we are, so... It's going to be fun yeah. to unveil. Yeah, and we'll read some of those entries when that time comes. Um, but just a little bit of how today's show is going to go. We'll get to that here in a bit. But today we're going to be talking about what we've been reading, but also we're going to move on to literary years a little bit and talk about, you know, great, what, what does it mean to have a literary year? Why is, uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we get to. We're talking about literary years, and in particular, Toward the end of the show, we're going to step back exactly 100 years to 1922 and talk about that year in literature. But first, Paul, what have you been reading? Yeah, well, I have been reading uh, Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. So this is kind of weird. I've, I've had kind of mixed feelings with a couple of the Morrison books that I've read in the past, which makes me feel like a heretic or, you know, I'm always a little nervous to admit that because... It's one of those where you feel like the fault clearly lies with you, that there's not a connection there. You know, she's obviously incredibly important, incredibly talented. She's, you know, a national treasure. So, you know, for whatever reason, though, I've just never quite connected with her works before. Um, And I'm kind of wondering in the past, I've always listened to the books of hers that I've encountered on audio. And so I'm kind of wondering if maybe that might have been some of the disconnect. You know, an audio book can be a wonderful experience, but it can also sometimes you know, turn out not to be the best. And and I, I'm wondering if that might be the case. So anyway, I was talking to our friend Kim McNeil and saw that she was going to read it. And I had kind of admitted a little bit that I'd just never quite been able to make it work with Toni Morrison. And she invited me to kind of join her in reading Song of Solomon. So I decided that was a good way to do it. So I jumped right in. Um, just real quickly, it's basically the story of uh, a guy named Milkman Dead, which is quite the name. Um, And so it kind of follows his life and the lives of those around him. And it starts off with this kind of this neighborhood guy who is up on top of this rooftop and he's thinking about flying and he has like these, this wing, these wings or something constructed and he hurls himself off the rooftop and doesn't make it. Um, He was trying to fly and Morrison kind of uses that as an entry point because it says after that milkman, as he grows up, always, you know, looks at the sky and strives to fly himself. So you know, that's kind of the intro. And I will say, you know, I'm about 100 pages in and I'm already feeling much more of a connection with with her work than I have in the past. I'll just quickly read a, a short excerpt that I just thought was excellent. It's within the first maybe 20 pages. It says, solid, rumbling, likely to erupt without prior notice. Macon, that's the father figure. Macon kept each member of his family awkward with fear. His hatred of his wife glittered and sparked in every world, in every word he spoke to her. The disappointment he felt in his daughters sifted down on them like ash, dulling their butter complexions and choking the lilt out of what should have been girlish voices. Under the frozen heat of his glance, they tripped over door sills and dropped the salt cellar into the yolks of their poached eggs. The way he mangled their grace, wit, and self-esteem was the single excitement of their days. Without the tension and drama he ignited, they might not have known what to do with themselves. In his absence, his daughters bent their necks over their blood-red squares of velvet and waited eagerly for any hint of him, and his wife, Ruth, began her days stunned into stillness by her husband's contempt and ended them wholly animated by it. I was just thinking, like, man, in one paragraph, she just beautifully describes this family and some of the ways that she says things, you know, stunned into stillness, and some of those phrases she uses are just amazing, so... All that to say that it's going much better with Miss Morrison. I'm hoping that I can lose my her- heretical st- status and kind of get back into things. But yeah, it's really good so far. So nice. that's what I've been reading so far. All right. Well, I 
I've been reading a few things. One, I'm still going through a bunch of Jane Austen in preparation nice. for our next episode yeah. on Jane Austen. I, <laughs> I've been excited about many of our episodes. That's one that's kind of reaching the top. I, I can't wait to sit down with you and talk about Jane Austen. I know. Um, but other than that, I have been reading, I just started um, this week, Ann Tyler's newest uh, French Braid. Hmm. Um, it comes out on March 22nd. So, you know, when we release this episode, that's the the week it comes out. And it's just so refreshing to be in her world. She has such a clarity of writing and of conveying the emotions the characters are going through. And it's very fluid. I mean, the characters can go get kind of back and forth in their memories. And I'm never... I'm never stepping in the wrong spot. You know, I feel like she's just guiding me around it so nicely. Uh, I'm not far enough to even really know where it's going or what kinds of themes there are, but looking forward to it. Um, I have looked at a few reviews and it might, it might prove that my question, I don't know if you remember, but I asked, will she, you know, again, be um, nominated for the Booker Prize later on mm-hmm. this year, and maybe even finally win it. As you know, another American who keeps getting <laughs> now that they've opened it up for Americans, it keeps getting um, her books nominated, but then you know doesn't win. Right. Um, and based on the reviews I'm seeing, probably not, but maybe. I mean, it, it is it is still just really pleasant and nice to read. Mm-hmm. Not to say, and the pleasantness comes from just a sense of I'm in someone's hands who knows what they're doing, right. not because it's like all you know, sugar and all of that. It's, um, you know, there's a lot that's going on in the book, but the one that I'm a lot farther in and that I, uh, am very excited about is the trouble of happy that, or sorry, the trouble with happiness by Tova Ditlifson and translated, uh, by Michael Favala Goldman. This comes out on April 19th. It's a collection of short stories, um, Paul, this is amazing. I still haven't read the Copenhagen trilogy, mm. but this um, arc showed up as well as her novel Faces, um, which I haven't started yet, but I just started to jump in with these short stories. And it's it's amazing. Um, both the, the stories themselves, but the translation by Goldman is beautiful. I, I again, feel like I'm in the hands of, of a couple of masters at work here. And just as an example, here's here's how the whole collection begins with a story called The Umbrella that was in The New Yorker. So I had read it before, but just going back to it, I thought, wow, this is this is so good. Here's the beginning. Helga had always unreasonably expected more from life than it could deliver. People like her live among us, not differing conspicuously from those who instinctively settle their affairs and figure out precisely how given their looks, their abilities, and their environment, they can do what they need to do in the world. With respect to these three factors, Helga was only averagely equipped. You know? <laughs> wow. And really... this this little story is, is bizarre. It's very strange. It kind of took me to the to, into mind of, like, Barbara Comins. Mm. There's there's just a... I don't know, this, this Helga that we follow here doesn't seem to fit in her world and doesn't seem to understand that necessarily. And there's a strange fascination with getting an umbrella someday. Mm. And of course she's not treated very well by those around her, um, including her, her uh, eventual husband, um, Egon, kind of a a terrible person at, at the end of the day as well. But really love the story and the stories that can, that, that follow it, just keep going in that, that vein. Um, but yeah, that comes out in about a month, everybody. Yeah, and it's definitely something to look, look for. Yeah. Just curious. Are those longer stories or shorter stories or, or pretty is it short? Very. Okay. They vary just slightly. Like the umbrella may even be one of the longest ones at like 19, 20 mm-hmm. pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them are closer to 10 or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there it, it, there's nothing. It's not like an Alice Munro collection where it's 300 pages and six stories, you know, or right. something like that. Right. There's um, there, there's a whole bunch in this little short book. Yeah. So I'm excited for that one. As we've talked about with the Copenhagen trilogy, it was so good, and 
I was looking, I couldn't remember who the translator was and there's actually two translators listed and he's one of them. So I can't remember if he did two of the three or, or exactly how that worked out. But I, I do know from reading that one that the translation was really, really well done. So, Well, and I uh, hope this, this short story book uh, kind of takes off, you know, and, and becomes something that, that I see a lot when we ask what people are reading. Mm-hmm. It's definitely worth it for sure. Probably go, and I guess this is another one of my questions about 2022, uh, which short story collection is going to be my favorite of the year. Uh, this one or Colin Barrett's homesickness. I haven't started Colin Barrett's homesickness. I do have an arc of that one too. Um, but man, he's going to have to do some hard work <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to get there. <laughs> like she has a good lead. Starting she's out. got a lead. Yeah. She's, she, she has uh, impressed me um, a lot so far and, and in just a way that I'm, you know, kind of shocked and delighted uh, by the skill and all of that all at the same time. So, yeah, that sounds really good. I'm intrigued because just in the, in the trilogy, there was such a variance between in the early stages, there was a lot of like really good growing up and it was a little bit more innocent and light. And then it got so dark by the end. And so I know, you know, it was a memoir, so it's slightly different, but just her skills and, and her range. I can't imagine what she's capable of in a short story. So I, I can't wait to dig into those. Well, why don't we go into our topic today? Now, this is pretty vague and mm-hmm. we hope it'll be kind of fun, but we don't know all that we're, <laughs> we're going to be, be saying here. Um, but I thought it might be kind of interesting to talk about literary years as just a thing. You know, mm-hmm. we, we think of certain years and, and just, for me per- personally, sometimes it can be my own personal year in reading. You know, maybe the book didn't come out that year, but what are some of my best reading years? Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe where do those two things um, overlap? And sometimes that's with book prizes that I'm looking at. So, for example, um, I was in London in, at the end of 2004 when that Booker Prize shortlist came out. And it's always been one of my favorite, like, years of reading, you know, 2004 or, and, and publication years, because I had such a good time reading those books and talking about them to people around London. I remember once my cab driver was talking to me about Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell. <laughs> and that was just really, really fun and engaging. And so 2004 stands out as a great publication year. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we often hear of 1925, the year that Mrs. Dalloway came out and The Great Gatsby and a bunch of others. And maybe we'll get into some of those. Um, But what do you think of when we think of literary years? You know, what's, what's, when I brought this topic up, it was me Mm -hmm. who brought up this weird, maybe unwieldy thing. Uh, What did you think of? Yeah, no, I think like you, I, I, my first thought goes to kind of my own personal years, kind of like what we've talked about at the beginning of a year, or the end of a year, you kind of look back on your year, or you look ahead and plan it that way. But then I, I did the same as you, where I started to think of it more broadly. And it's interesting, I was trying to get my head wrapped around, you know, the impact of like, all of the lists that come out nowadays. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that that was necessarily a thing in past years. I'm sure there was always some anticipation within certain circles, or people would know what books were coming out. But it's interesting, I, th- I feel like right now, anytime you get the previews from, you know, Book Riot or, you know, the millions or all these different things where you kind of have the year laid out for you to some extent. Uh-huh. I wonder like how much that has impacted the way that we view literary years where you start kind of bookmarking things or putting it on your wish list or pre-ordering. So that was one place where my mind went. And then I was also thinking back, you know, you and I, we've talked about this a couple of times. We met, you know, online on a, a forum that was pretty active back in the you know late 90s, early 2000s, I guess it was. Um, called Palimpsest. And as far as just years that have had big impacts on my life, there was a few years in there, probably in the around 2003, 2004, 2005, where, you know, John Self and some of these other people that were on there that we were friends with, they had huge impacts on some of the, mm-hmm. the literature that I was thinking of at that time. There was, you know, Philip Roth and Kazu Ishiguro and um, I'm trying to think like Ian McEwen, some of those, you know, that they were kind of in the literary limelight at that time. And so when I think back to years that started to kind of broaden my horizon on the literary world to some extent, 
I think that's definitely something that comes to mind for me is just that excitement in your, you know, a lot of those people were so well known, but just as everybody enters into a stage in their relationship with literature where, and probably multiple stages where you get these doors open to you. And that was definitely one for me where some of the literary fiction started to open. And so I think right in those early 2000s for me was very formative in kind of seeing some of these different things like Ian McEwan thinking of like Atonement or Saturday or some of these things where to me at the time I was like, this is so exciting, all these different cool things that people are doing and everything. So, you know, that's another place where my mind went. Hmm. Well, we are talking specifically today about publication years. And the reason we're doing so is that it's 2022 and one that often rises to the top of anyone talking about, oh, this, you know, monumental kind of watershed year of of publication would be 1922. And so we're going to step back here in a, in a little bit to, to go through that. Um, in your in your time thinking about this topic, Paul, did other did other literary years of publication pop up that you thought, ooh, ooh, that's a, that's a, that is a great one. You know, did anything surprise you where you thought all of those books were published in, you know, X year, you know, was there anything like that? And if not, yeah. no worries. I'm just well, curious. No, I mean, not immediately. Cause I was trying to think of that and I, you know, and so I was doing a little research and just sniffing around a little bit just to see, because like you said, 1925 and 1922 both spring up a lot, but I was like, you know, the twenties were obviously very impactful, but there's gotta be <laughs> some other time periods. And so I don't know. There's, there's a lot of years where big books, you know, were published for sure. You know, you think back to like the early, you know, 1600s, for example, like you have Shakespeare (laughs) coming out, you have Don Quixote coming out, you have the King James Bible. I mean, I was, I was looking, it's not all in one year, but within like a 20 year period, talk about, you know, something that changed the, the course of literature, you know, for sure. And then I was, I guess, to be honest, I'm kind of thinking of it more in time periods, but I was thinking of like the fifties, 1950s, for one thing, the beats, you know, those started coming out pretty rapidly. And that was part of this cultural movement that led off, you know, into the sixties. But then also the fifties had kind of echoes of earlier in the 1800s, but the sci-fi explosion that took place in the fifties, you know, again, this isn't necessarily one year, but if you start looking back at, at those decades within a two or three year period, there's all kinds of, of stuff coming out, you know, and then one more that came to mind when I was looking through was 1883. I was looking, so I was thinking about the impact it had on children's literature. And like, maybe even if you think about like Disney. So just think about this in 1883, Treasure Island from Robert Louis Stevenson, The Adventures of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi, and The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle, <laughs> all in one year. So I was thinking like, just as far as you think of books that are on kids shelves, that have impacted cartoons, shows, movies in the years past. So 1883 stood out to me a little bit too. When was Little Women published? I'm looking that up right now. Had to be somewhere around there, I'm thinking. 1868. Oh, okay. So back just right after the, the Civil War. I didn't realize it was that close to the Civil War. Yeah, no, I didn't either. But then like, I don't know, a couple years after that, in the 1870s, you have you know, Jules Verne, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and some of those start coming out. And um, like I said, that was probably probably in the 1870s when Jules Verne was really coming out with a lot of his stuff was one step forward in kind of that, what would later be called sci-fi. And then, you know, you move on to the 50s and there's like Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, you know, all these different authors that are doing that too. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if you want to get into like, why some of these years might come about, but just leading into our discussion, do you, do you want to do it now or do you want to wait? No, I think that that's fair. I mean, there that's that's one of the reasons I like doing this. Just I'll, I'll step back and maybe uh, bring this about. Um, my good friend, David Blakesley, he's uh, someone I've been doing podcasting with for a decade, essentially now, about movies and in particular the Criterion Collection. One of his big projects, you know, like life's work (laughs) Mm -hmm. is to go through the Criterion Collection um, year by year, meaning, you know, what movies were released in 1930. I'm going to do each of them and I'm going to do it calendar year. What came out in January of that year and so on, you know, and of course, he got through the first several, you know, years quite quickly 
there weren't that many in the collection at the time he started and, you know, a little bit more limited. And, but he's been in the sixties and seventies for as long as I've you know been podcasting with him, right. but his approach to that is so interesting because he, he takes it from here's how this stuff is coming about. You know, here's what's going on in the world. Here's what was going on in film a couple of years ago. That's now kind of affecting these films. It is very interesting to see the trends and the historical context surrounding these things. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's a, that's a reason why I kind of like to to think about things this way a little bit. I mean, what, I, I like that that leads to those thoughts. It's not the only way to think of things, you know. Right. When we do our best books we read this year, you know, scattered. Both of us had books from all different time periods, many different years. Um, so certainly, it's not the way that I read. But I think it's fun to to learn from from that. So, so yeah, that's I think that's definitely something I'd like to to hear and and touch on. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I projects like this make me realize I don't I definitely don't read that way, and sometimes I don't know that it's a weakness or like a shortcoming. But sometimes one of the things I like about literature is it like I think we talked about this a little bit in our last episode is just it exposes some of those areas where you just like, man, I don't know anything about this part of the world or this Mm -hmm. period of history. And so that can be a little overwhelming, but on the other hand, like when we're doing it, like we are just for fun, it's actually kind of exciting because then you can just start reading a particular period. But I definitely am more of a magpie reader as far as I'm chasing language or just a topic rather than the methodical approach that like somebody like David takes, but I I'm always fascinated by the different ways that people approach this stuff. And I think you can learn a lot from somebody like that, because if you're reading a lot of these books that have these historical connections, or you're doing a little background reading, it can add so much richness to these books that otherwise you would really enjoy, but you might miss out on a lot of things. So I was just thinking about, you know, we can talk about 1922 in particular, but like what would cause some of these years Mm -hmm. to be standouts. And I think obviously um, one of the things would just be, you know, historical events that are going on at the time. So you think of obviously wars, that's one of the first things that comes, comes to mind. Um, Mm -hmm. Or, you know, sometimes it's something like the beat, you know, where they're reacting against kind of cultural, you know, assumptions or the way things have been. And it's kind of this act of rebellion or, pushing the limits to see what you can do. You know, I think that weighs into it a lot. And when I think about why the twenties in particular was such a strong decade, you know, we can talk about 1922, but I think both of those factors Mm -hmm. obviously played, played a big part in it, but yeah. What about you? Do you have any other thoughts on why these years, you know, sometimes it's probably coincidence, but I think often there are bigger reasons. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's interesting how something kind of gets in the air at times. Um, Mm -hmm. it reminds me of when you're watching a flock of birds fly and Mm -hmm. they have that, uh, synchronized kind of wavy pattern that, you know, I can't discern what is guiding them and why they all turn at a certain time. You know, it just looks really cool and it looks like they're doing it in uniform. I do think that there are things that happen in society and in culture that start pushing people that direction. You know, you think of like the discovery of calculus and how two mathematicians discover that at about the exact same time, completely independent of each other. Mm-hmm. It's not because, you know, they they both just hap- happened, you know, had they lived in ancient Greece, they would have discovered it then. It's that things were leading to that point. You know, people's presentations, thoughts were percolating that people you know, kind of on that same page, we'll start to develop those ideas independent of each other. It happens Mm -hmm. in in art and science a a lot. Um, Sometimes there are, you know, sui generis breakthroughs where you just look at it and think, well, that that has no precedent and no no real, you know, form that we can look at that led to it. Like a Moby but, Dick or something like that, maybe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Even though, you know, he, of course, is doing a lot with with Shakespeare, but he's not right. really writing what other people are writing at the time. It's not like um, Nathaniel Hawthorne was, you know, also working on his great 
you know, novel about a, you know, some giant animal that's supposed to represent everything in the yeah. universe. Um, so those things happen, but there's, I think a lot more of the, the, the trend lines, you know, these modern writers that we'll be talking about here in a little bit, they are reading each other's work and they're reading similar works from around the world. And they're also going through similar time periods, you know, with world war one, for example, and the concepts that are, that are kind of floating around in that of, we thought we were a high, you know, a a highly civilized people and Mm -hmm. look at what we just did to each other. Look at what this, look at how we destroyed both the land and the people um, we can see this now too because it's being photographed. Um, it's coming back home to London, right. and so it affects the psyche. It, it's a there's a reason that they start breaking away from what they viewed as kind of sentimental realism of the Victorian age and start writing this much more, uh, you know, disjointed and um, trying to be psychologically real. Um, works that are kind of kind of bizarre, the, and and they're doing it at the same time, and and they're not the only ones, and they aren't even you know the ones we'll talk about today weren't necessarily the first that did all of this, right. but it does lead into that kind of that kind of stuff. I mean, think of today how how many books and stories and and movies now are playing with like alternate dimensions and alternate universes. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there is trends where people are like, well, I'm going to jump on this trend because it's, you know, it's going to make me money. I'm going to, I'm going to hitch, hitch onto this train. But I've heard a lot of stories where people are like writing a book and then lo and behold, another book just like it gets published right when they're about to finish it. And they, you know, they really are kind of unique, but they are, it's because of what's being discussed out there. People are just being led to similar things. Mm-hmm. Um, not always. And again, I'm not trying to be too reductive here. No. Um, I think it's fun to, to think about it that way. But something you said in our last episode may kind of is what I've been thinking about right now while you're saying that is, I think you said something about how fun it was with Brandon Sanderson having those books released because it was more and more, you don't feel like there's those cultural moments where everybody you know, shares one thing because we're mm-hmm. so fragmented. And I was curious about that when it comes to these literary years or the way that things are going, because I could see it going one of two ways to some extent with the internet and, and streaming services and all these different exposures we have to media, it is a lot more fragmented, but there's also this kind of guiding force of like, <laughs> everybody's watching game of Thrones or, you know, whatever it is, not everybody, but you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so I'm just curious going forward, you know, if, if and how that will change the way some of these movements happen. Cause your point about like alternate realities or like you think about AI right now, like that's in mm, every oh movie, gosh. every book or all over the place. And you go back to something like, you know, we were talking about Jules Verne or in the 1950s, there was another big push when there's these technological surges like that, you know, the industrial revolution kind of brings about this new way of thinking of all these things we might be able mm. to do in the future. Or, you know, in the fifties, there was so many, you know, kitchen appliances onto the space race and all these different things where it's kind of in the zeitgeist where people are thinking about this stuff. And, you know, it's interesting to think about where it might go in the future. And then speaking mm-hmm. of Moby Dick, you know, just not to get too far afield, but sometimes there's those works like that, that maybe did jump ahead of the rest of their peers and they kind of fall flat on their face at the time. And they're only later recognized for the genius that they were. So you always, I, I, you can't help but wonder what's going on right now that might, will we're people look back at some time, right? Yeah. And maybe <laughs> the like rest of us years, are on the wavelength to get it. Exactly. <laughs> we're behind the times, but like in 20 years, 50 years, a hundred years, will there be some years that are happening right now? Or maybe it was like, you know, 2019, can you believe they missed all this stuff that came out? You know, so it's, I don't know, when you start thinking about it historically, it, it definitely opens up some interesting ideas. It is fun to think of what what books will be the great books of the 21st century, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we're in the early stages of it, but have we already read some of them? Um, and, you know, I remember when uh, Bolaño's 2666 came out, mm-hmm. everyone kind yeah. of saying, this is going to be one of them. I happen to agree about that, but what else is there, you know, when you think of the 20th century, 
what books and again what years stand out 1922 is kind of the first uh, year now i i love a lot of books that came out before that um even more than books that came out in 1922 but it does seem like that's the watershed year mm-hmm. are we about to get another thing like that you know with um with everything that's going on in the world today could 2022 match probably not you know i don't maybe someday but maybe 2027 will be a year when a lot of things come together with the pandemic, with this, you know, the, with these wars and, and who knows, you know, not hopeful that, that those are the things that lead to it. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, what, what could they be? Um, here's another year that, that pops up sometimes. And I want to see what you think about connections uh, to the extent that, that we can. Uh, 1950, again, post-war. You know, this is uh, like like we're doing 1922. Here's 1950. Mm-hmm. Um, Isaac Asimov's I, Robot. And we're still writing a million, you know, AI mm-hmm. books that still don't, to me, match what he was doing even all the way back then. But um, I get a little tired and cranky about all the AI books being I written know. today that say the exact same thing <laughs> over and over and over again. I'm with you. Um, Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. You know, those two, th- those are pretty su- substantial works of Absolutely. science fiction. Uh, Patricia Highsmith's Strangers on a Train. I, I don't know the connection between that. And it's easy to look at Martian Chronicles and iRobot and think of, mm-hmm. you know, now we're moving on to space, look at the technology and a little bit of optimism even about um, technology, uh, as well as its its detriments. Um, but Strangers on a Train, just a, a great... A great thriller. Uh, Doris Lessing's The Grass is Singing. Admit I don't know very much about that one. Um, C.S. Lewis's The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, 1950. Mm. Um, and then, you know, uh, there, there, there are others, but those were kind of the ones that stood out in 1950. I wouldn't match that with 1922 by any means, but... No. Um, but it is, you know, it's just kind of fun, I think, to think of people getting these all at the same time one year. <laughs> I know. No, another one a few years later, I was, I was kind of highlighting some different years, um, 1961. So you have Joseph Heller's Catch-22, V.S. Naipaul's A House for Mr. Biswas, which I haven't read, but I know is hugely impactful on a lot of writers and is very well known. Richard Yates's Revolutionary Road, Walker Percy's The Movie Go- Goer. Muriel Sparks, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. Hmm. Stanislaw Lem's Solaris. J.D. Salinger's Franny and Zoe. And then, I don't know where this one falls in, but Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach. So, I mean, (laughs) again, like... It's like Catch-22. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You can draw easy (laughs) comparisons between the two. But, you know, again, I don't know. I think, obviously... um, each one might be speaking to some different things, but like Catch-22 and Revolutionary Road, they're going about it in very different ways, but they're very much questioning, you know, what has come before and kind of looking at it in new ways, you know, very different ways because Yates, it's it's very dark and straightforward and not pulling any punches. Whereas Joseph Heller, he is absolutely critical of, of the past and war specifically, but it's in a very different satirical, you know, way but anyway just as far as years go i thought that one was definitely noteworthy and i don't know if you notice when you get into certain periods right around the 60s um your friend agatha christie boy she was <laughs> prolific she was publishing I'm, as i'm going through these years i'm like she had two that year one the next year one the year after that you know and she was really coming out with a lot so well paul why don't we take a little bit of a break from literary years and move on to our giveaway announcement. You know, who's the winner of the Archipelago, you know, every month a gift, you know, arriving mm-hmm. <laughs> as soon as you get your membership started. Christmas in March. Christmas in March. That's all right. <laughs> Before we, we choose the winner, which we'll do randomly, I think we should read some of the entries. We got we got a lot, and, and several of them are quite long, so we can't read everybody's. Uh, but this was a lot of fun, again, to go through and see people's favorite archipelagos, things people were looking forward to, and also to to hear from people who had never known about archipelago books, but were excited by what they saw and are 
you know, giving it a go, trying to win their own subscription. That's a great way to get to know a publisher. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I really love the mixture of there was a lot of people who were clearly old fans like us of Archipelago and, and had been following them for years and had some very specific favorites and good memories. And then there was also a lot of people who, like you said, they're like, oh, this is a new publisher to me or, or I've heard about them, but I've never tried them. So it was a really nice mix. And it's exciting to see all the different ways that people are interacting with these books. Yeah. All right. So do you have yours pulled up? I do. I'm ready. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start. This first email is from Scott and I, I won't give last names until we announce the winner, whoever that is. But uh, Scott says, I really enjoy your podcast and the recent episode was not an exception. Thank you for the opportunity to win a membership to Archipelago Books. I have several favorites from Archipelago. Mahmoud Darwish, Alex, er, oh, sorry, Eric Cheviard, Magdalena Tuli. But if pressed to name a favorite from their back catalog, I'd have to say Brayton Breitenbach's Murar. Murar. Murar, I think, Paul. I think so. That sounds <laughs> I, good. And I have read this one. Um, the disgui- described as a docudream. Uh, but I always just had to read the word vaguely in my mind, you know. I know. It's funny how that happens. <laughs> uh, Breitenbach composed Murar uh, while imprisoned in South Africa during apartheid. Yet it is not a standard prison memoir. As the LA Times says, after reading... I'm gonna, Scott, you got to stop writing the word here, man. <laughs> Murar. <laughs> the specifics of his life seem like mere facts. It is a book he could have written anywhere, in any field, any cafe, any coffin. There also, look, was the blue gum tree, full of dust and without monkeys. This observation and many, many others are part of his memory, of his childhood, a source of joy, his life. It cannot be taken away. Even more wonderful, these are also our memories in the tribal sense, human memories. The dreams, the symbols have the DNA of communal memory. They are drawn from the same fountain that inspired the Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Alice in Wonderland, and yes, the Greek myths. Breitenbach has traveled to the place where stories are made and returned with a great big bag full. I read Murar over 10 years ago, and it remains as vivid for me today. As for their forthcoming titles, I am most anticipating Scholastique Mukasanga's Kiboko, uh, translated by Mark Polizati. I am intrigued by both the blurb from Kutsi and that it is set in Rwanda, but is not set during contemporary times. Oh, that's great. Our next one says, it's from uh, Joe, and it says, Hello, Trevor and Paul. Thanks for putting this amazing giveaway together with one of my favorite publishers. It was really hard to narrow this down to one backlist and one forthcoming title, especially after your most recent episode in picks. But here goes. The backlist title I'm most excited to read is Spring Tides by Jacques Poulain. I discovered Autumn Rounds through the MOOCs podcast last year, and it ended up being one of my favorites of 2021. So that right there, that's exciting, Trevor. I love Mm -hmm. stuff like that. I love the characters and pace of this novel, and every time I picked it up, it took me to a happy place. The setting of Spring Tides, an uninhabited island, sounds equally wonderful, and I sense that this one also has Poulan's trademark charm and tenderness as well. (laughs) Browsing Archipelago's upcoming titles, the one I think I'm most excited to dip in and discover is Salka Valka by Haldor Laxness. And that's the one I had too, so great mm-hmm. minds. I've had Laxness's novel Independent People on my bookshelf and TBR for a few years now. And like Trevor and Paul, it's a comfort read in the sense that I know it's a book I'm going to love based on its description and reviews. But take comfort knowing it's one I can reserve for a rainy day. <laughs> this forthcoming book sounds like an excellent coming-of-age tale with, a strong fe- with strong female characters and a quote from its description. Salka Valka is a novel of epic proportions, living and breathing with its vibrant cast of characters, filled with tenderness, humor, and remarkable pathos. If that doesn't sound like a five-star read to me, I don't know what does. Thanks again to you both for the many hours of listening enjoyment I get from the podcast, and happy reading. Thanks, Joe. Right. Yeah, thanks, Joe. All right, the next one is from Bonnie. Bonnie says, Dear Trevor and Paul, choosing a favorite archipelago book is not an easy task. I could have gone with the twin. <laughs> Gerard Bakker's wonderful novel. I see where this is going, Bonnie. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking I really of like, great minds one. think alike. <laughs> yeah, it's cheating like we do. Yeah. <laughs> but one of you picked that one and I wanted something different. So I settled on another one instead. Translation is a Love Affair by Jacques Poulan. And Poulan is, is popular. Yeah. It was my very first archipelago. Read in 2011. I wrote a few comments about it at that time. 
This novella tells the story of a young French-Canadian woman who is translating the work of a much older novelist. During the course of one summer, the two of them come to know each other very well through the solving of a mystery. That's not what this book is about. This book is about love and memories and healing and, most of all, words and the crafting of a sentence. Haunting prose and a beautiful phrasing had me holding my breath at times. Here's an example. I spent the afternoon and part of the evening in a kind of torpor, broken by brief memories that came back to me in the form of images or words. For instance, this remark that I'd noted during the class I'd just referred to, every day to me, or every day, to keep me faithful to your text, my words hug the curves of your writing like a lover nestling in her sweetheart's arms. Milena had written that to Kafka, and Bonnie says, simply sublime. Mm. There are many books in the Archipelago catalog that I'd like to read, including White Masks by Elias Khoury, The Pastor by Hanna Orstevik, and The Dog of Tithwal by Sadat Hassan Manto. Guys, I'm just I'm just reeling on these names. I mean, yeah, I hope this, this is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> or I could start with the ones on my shelf now, including Job by Joseph Roth and Kin by Milenko Yurgovic. From the upcoming publications, I think I'm really drawn to Around the Day in 80 Worlds, because, come on, with a title like that, how could I go wrong? <laughs> also, the format of poetry, short stories, and essays from an Argentine writer really interests me. Uh, so... Thanks so much, Bonnie. Yes, you, you you added a little note that you hope you got it right and that your entry counted. Of course it does. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Okay, our next one is from Chris. It says, my favorite archipelago book is probably Mircea Caterescu's Blinding. Blinding was one of those books that had always been on the periphery of my radar until, on a whim, I requested it from my library. Shout out to the incredible selection at the Los Angeles Public Library. It came in, I brought it home, and I put it on my coffee table where it remained <laughs> until I picked it up late one evening. I had hardly begun when I started to read. And then he, he gives us a, a page, which I'm not going to have time to read, but he gives an example of, of the great writing. And he says, I was thunderstruck. I mean, listen to that prose quote. I try to read the runes of windows and apartment balconies full of wet laundry, the apartments across the street that broke my life in two, but this text is not human and I cannot understand it anymore. Incredible. Now, I'm someone who has to underline, add exclamation points, and write in the margins of the books I love, which you obviously can't do in a library book. So I promptly closed the book, ordered a <laughs> copy, and impatiently drummed my fingers until it arrived. What followed was one of the most intense and incredible reading experiences of my life. Reading it is a bit like how some survivors describe nearly drowning, how the water engulfs and presses in everywhere, how panic sets in, and then how an unexpected calm occurs. Well, I thankfully have never really nearly drowned, but reading Blinding was kind of like that in the best way possible. The rhythmic intensity of the prose submerges you so completely that you almost have to remind yourself to come up for air. But if you let the language engulf you, if you let it take you down and up and sideways into labyrinthine Bucharest, then suddenly the prose opens up and brightness infuses everything, and you experience the book in a way that, in my years of reading, is rare and beautiful. I just want to stop for a minute and say, wow, that's great writing. Mm -hmm. Makes me really want to pick it up. So then an archipelago book that Chris is really looking forward to. Also a tough decision. I'm looking forward to one you mentioned on the show, Salka Valka by Haldor Laxness and translated by Philip Rufton. I loved Wayward Heroes, also translated by Rufton, and, and which I discovered while on a summer long reading of the Icelandic sagas and independent people and have long wanted to read Salka Valka, particularly now in the Rufton translation. I can't wait to read another of Laxness's tender but epic books. So, wow. As usual, this is adding. I know. Well, it just makes me want to stop. I've got Wayward Heroes sitting right here in front of me. Yeah. And I haven't read it yet. I know. Um, me too. I guess I'm going to have to stop reading French Braid and Jane Austen <laughs> and the Ditlis and just jump right into that. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. Yeah. And. Everybody should know we love these these emails, regardless of what they contain, even if it's just here's my favorite book and here's what I'm looking forward to. We we love them. Mm -hmm. I will say it, it is a, a real treat to feel like we're kind of getting to know you a little bit when you share experiences to like, you know, putting the book back at the library and ordering a copy. I think that's just really fun. And so that thanks is. for sharing that, Chris. Um, our next one that we'll share is from Stephen. And Stephen says, 
Hello, thanks first and foremost for your podcast. I'm a relatively new listener, but I'm eager to dig into your past episodes. I'm always eager for more good book talk. Uh, Regarding your Archipelago Books episode, below is my selection for a back catalog book and a forthcoming title. Back catalog, I have a hard time choosing between Hrabel and Tabuchi, two authors I've read nothing from and about whom I've heard only the highest praise. I think in the end I would go with Tabuchi, though, and I think I would choose for Isabel Amandala, though all of the titles they've put out from him look equally appealing. Uh, From the forthcoming titles, Brenner by Hermann Berger, I'm a sucker for books whose form is largely decided by the mechanisms of memory. There we go. Mm. Both Paul and I are on with that. And a sucker for end-of-life reminiscences. On top of this, there seems to be a comical element to Brenner that many books taking similar approaches tend to to askew. Anyway, thanks again. Good stuff. All right, the next one is from Adam. Says my all-time favorite archipelago title is Wolf Hunt by Velo Petrov, translated by Angela Rodell. It's my favorite because of the way it's able to sweep the reader right into 20th century Europe, in particular into the rural, traditional, peasant way of life, and how its characters are people who carry on day to day, even during the tectonic changes of those times. And I felt such emotion as the book goes on and details the very human costs paid by these good people. I also admire the way Petrov writes it concentrating on a member of each of the six families within the larger story, ripping out and par- rippling out in parts from those central characters to touch on other relatives. Petrov writes by unfolding the connections, these are great, dramatic slash comic, between the six men, one big family epic which I love. I'm most looking forward to the next book forthcoming, I think, Moldy Strawberries by Caio Fernando Abreu. I enjoy writers who lay it all on the line, and I read a quote, And I read a quote recently about Abreu that said for whom writing is a form of salvation from madness, from death, from invisibility, and especially from the self. Thanks, Adam. The next one is from Ryan. Ryan says, hello, Trevor and Paul. Let me first say that I've really enjoyed your podcast so far. It has quickly become my favorite book podcast. Well, thanks, Ryan. Um, that's that that means a lot. I find that our tastes and interests align pretty well and I've learned a lot from both of you already. I look forward to every new episode that comes out. For the Archipelago Books giveaway, here are my books. I don't currently have a favorite pu- book published by Archipelago because I've never read one of their books. Well, awesome. Ryan, you know, that this You're is perfect then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the book I am most confident I will love is Kin by Milenko Yurgovich. While the tragedy and scope of the work the focus on the various wars of the 20th century appeals to me, but also because it's a it's about a country I know almost nothing about. My favorite books are ones that appeal to both my love of literature and of history, and I think this one fits the bill. It's perfect the upcoming, for this episode. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. To yeah. Say. Yeah. The upcoming book I'm most looking forward to reading is Salka Valka by Haldor Laxness. I hope that book does well, everybody. I hope everyone picks it up. It's getting a lot of uh, a lot of uh, excitement here. <laughs> the rugged and isolated setting in Iceland really appeals to my sensibility. I loved Annie Pruel's uh, The Shipping News, partly for this reason. Oh, I hadn't made that connection yet, but that's mm. a good one. Mm. And I've always been fascinated by Vikings and Norse mythology. But I also really enjoy coming-of-age novels, and this one sounds like it will be fantastic. All right. Well, let's do one more, Paul, so that we can get to the to the drawing. Um, uh, we've left people waiting long enough. All right. This next one is from Padma. It says, Dear Trevor and Paul, the book that I want to talk about is Ambai's A Kitchen in the Corner of the House, translated from Tamil by Lakshmi Holmstrom. I first came across Ambai's work when I was an undergraduate in India. Okay. Tamil is my mother tongue. And while I can speak it fluently, I do not know how to read and write Tamil and I read Ambai's work in translation. After all these years, I still remember my experience of reading Ambai's collection of stories, A Purple Sea, In a Forest, A Deer, and her stories in the pages of Katha Prize Stories. A Kitchen in the Corner of the House is a selection of Ambai's work from her years of writing. To read her is to encounter women who, within the constraints of marriage, the burdens and pressures of domestic life and societal expectations, manage to assert their independence and have rich, complicated interior lives. Ambai was my first experience of reading feminism as it applied to my society. She made visible the lives of women who would otherwise have remained invisible. It was such a delight to have Archipelago Press put together this beautifully produced book of selected stories. 
I was thrilled to revisit some of my favorite stories, Paras Parasakti and others in a plastic box, and to read some stories I don't remember having read before. Ambai won the Saita Academy Award earlier this year, and I hope she I'm glad this one's yours, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Tongue twisters sometimes. Um, Ambai won the Saita Say Sayiti Academy Award earlier this year, and I hope she has more international awards and readership coming her way. So hopefully I didn't ruin too many of those pronunciations there. But And then Padma says, the book from Archipelago's backlist that I have on my TBR and that I most want to read is Newcomers. Oh, boy. I should have done a little. <laughs> is it? Lose just, just do it, Paul. Just go for it. <laughs> All right. Lose, Lose, Lose. Covid shit. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> the book from Archipelago's backlist that I have on my TBR and that I most want to read is Newcomers by Loze Kovacic, translated from Slovenian by Michael Biggins. It is the first in a three-part autobiography and is described on Archipelago's website as narrated by the boy with uncanny naivete. The novel follows his family's journey from their home in Switzerland to the father's home country of Slovenia in a fragmented mosaic of memories. I love journeys, fragmentary, fragmentary stories retold from memory, child narrators, and coming-of-age stories, so I'm really looking forward to reading this. Among the forthcoming titles, I have my eye on Ti Amo by Hanna Orstabik, translated from the Norwegian by Martin Aitken, out in September this year, just around my birthday, she says. I was bowled over by Orstabik's love, me too, and I hope to read The Pastor before the next one comes out, so I can't wait. She says, I loved the Archipelago Books podcast episode. I love the press and everything they do. I love their catalog and the quotes that come up on the right, top right of their website. So thanks for the episode. I'm looking forward to the Jane Austen one. <laughs> thanks, Padma. Thank you, Padma. All right. There are a lot more that, I, honestly, I would love to, to read them. Several that, uh, it's, you guys uh, gave us a lot of riches to go through. And, uh, but we'll get on. Let's do the drawing. Paul, I'm about to plug in the number. And Paul, can you, I don't know if you can read who won. I can. The winner is Kim McNeil. Congratulations, Kim. You're in for a treat. <laughs> Congratulations, Kim. We didn't read your entry. I guess I'm going to do that really quick because it's also really nice. Uh, Kim says, good evening, I'm late as usual. Yes, Kim's came in at the last moment. I, I saw it this morning when I got up ready to do this. Wow. Of the archipelago books I have read, I have many, many more to go. I agree with Paul that Love by Hanna Orstovic is one of my favorites. It is such a beautifully constructed novella that stayed with me long after I read it. The story takes place over a long winter night, and it is both meditative and haunting. One of the most affecting stories of loneliness and silence that I have read. Which leads me to be very excited about her book, Tiamo. Well, this is like reading Padma's again, which is not a bad thing. Uh, publishing in September, around Padma's birthday. We'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll remember that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is not to love about this description? Here it goes. What can be found within a gaze? What lies inside a painting or behind a handful of repeated words? These are the questions that haunt our unnamed narrator as she tends to her husband, stricken with cancer, in the final months of his life. She examines the elements of their life together, their Vietnamese rose-colored folding table where they eat their meals, each of the New Year's Eves they've shared, their friendships, and the, their most intimate exchanges. With everything in flux, she searches for the facets that will remain. Hanna Orstovic writes, I have a compulsion for truth that feels like my very life force itself. Tentative, laced with a tingling frankness, Orstovic's prose adheres so closely to the inner workings of its narrator's mind as to nearly undo itself. In Martin Aitken's translation, Orstovic's piercing story sings. I always love listening to you guys. Keep up the great work. Cheers, Kim. Well, Kim, congratulations. That's exciting. Uh, we happen to know Kim, but uh, there was no cheating in, in any <laughs> of this. Um, I plugged in the random number, showed it to Paul. Um, and there we go. Yeah. Congratulations, Kim. I am very excited for her. We talk about with NYRB every month getting that Manila package, and I've been loving getting a similar package from Archipelago every month, and, and I know lots of other people who subscribe. So for everybody who didn't win, you know, I know that you know, different people's finances and other factors weigh into things, but even if you didn't win, I would at least consider if you can do it. 
going for this membership because you will just be thrilled. They every month they come up with some amazing books. It's always something different, you know, poetry and, and fiction and memoirs and all kinds of great stuff. So thanks so much to everybody for joining in and sharing your thoughts and we're gonna do more fun stuff in the future. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about it. Well, Paul, a hundred years ago, 1922, let's start the year with a bang because on February 2nd, 2022, or, you know, 2 2 of 22, yeah. uh, James Joyce published Ulysses and started to, you know, perhaps rather smugly, uh, wanted to change the calendar so that it was now living in the year one PSU, meaning one postscriptum Ulysses. We are now living in the year 101 PSU. And I, you know, I assume that's what you've always, you know, referred to as your right. by dates. Like I keep putting you, that on checks and people look at me with the strangest <laughs> expression. <laughs> but that's kind of where, where a lot started. Now, um, is Ulysses the only book of its type? And was it the first of its type? No, not necessarily. You know, even James Joyce himself had written something that was, you know, rather experimental with the portrait of the artist as a young man. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a lot that had kind of come before Ulysses, but it's pretty widely acknowledged to be the, you know, kind of the mature, you know, boom. Here's what we've been kind of circling around. Right. Here it is. Here's Ulysses. And we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about other books that have come out that year and just talk about this year, 100 years ago, uh, maybe celebrate it a little bit um, as as we enter 2022. Um, I think it's a year worth celebrating. What about you? Absolutely. Yeah. As I've, as I've discussed probably ad nauseum on this podcast, I mean, having read Ulysses fairly recently, I think, you know, it's more than deserving of all the hype. It's one of those that really did, like you said, there was a lot that led up to it, but as far as the statement of what can be done with literature and just, we talk about swinging for the fences or just going all in, this is like the epitome of that. It, everything that he threw into this book is just fascinating. I love that, you know, there's that swagger changing the calendar. He timed it to publish <laughs> on his 40th birthday. You know, the, he was a showman for, for such a seemingly fairly kind of quiet, reserved guy you know <laughs> when you see the pictures he doesn't necessarily look like a showman but man yeah he just came out going for it for sure so yeah i think it's great to start with this one it's um i don't know it's it's interesting how it came out in this climate of other people trying similar things and a lot of them were talking to each other and i don't know as you were reading about this year did you see any of the stuff about how different authors would publish something or be talking, sharing their works with somebody else. And the other one would be like, you know what? You just did exactly what I was trying to do. Mm-hmm. I feel like giving up now. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. Know. Virginia Woolf mm-hmm. um, was very discouraged by Ulysses first off because she didn't like it. Um, and that may have been a little bit, uh, you know, maybe she had some literary reasons and maybe also some snobbery reasons right? Um, for this. And maybe you know, some, I mean, I'm not saying it's better, but maybe some jealousy reasons too, just because mm-hmm. it seems like he kind of did what one of the things she was thinking about. So. Yeah, I think she was very discouraged. You read her diaries of that year, and there's a sense of this thing I've been working on. He just did it, the jerk, right. <laughs> you know. And, and she did, you know. She she had kind of been circling around the her great 1925 novel, Mrs. Dalloway. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ulysses takes place over the course of one day. Mrs. Dalloway takes place over the course of one day and kind of follows you through a town, you know, through London in that particular case. And I'm, I'm glad we have both of them so much, so much. I love these books. Um, I just, I just adore them. I'm glad Virginia Woolf didn't say, well, I guess now I'm going to go write, you know, a children's um, book. <laughs> right. Could have been cool, but I, I'm so glad she wasn't so discouraged that she just threw the towel in and, and didn't write Mrs. Dalloway. Um, you know, the connections are clear, even though I think she would kind of deny them um, and maybe rightfully so, you know, this was something she had been working on too. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing that that, that was going on at that time. I know that's where it's so fascinating. Like we were talking about where clearly there are bigger things going on 
But then at the same time, these people did know each other. So you never know what kind mm-hmm. of conversations had happened over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or something that yeah, and they wrote letters to each other all the yeah. time. In fact, that's one of the fun things. So w- Virginia Woolf also published a book this year, uh, Jacob's Room. She's also writing to T.S. Eliot, who published The Wasteland later on that year. Uh, you know, speaking of another watershed uh, monument of, oh, of modern uh, literature and modern poetry, The Wasteland. Oh, I get I get chills with that one. That that that's my favorite of all the books published in 1922. Of all the things published in 1922 that I'm oh. that I'm aware of, I, and I I adore The Wasteland. Um, and she was writing with T. S. Eliot and kind of saying how she couldn't even get into this boring Ulysses. You know, and and I just don't don't even enjoy this book. I I've been trying to finish it, but I I just can't do it. Meanwhile, T. S. Eliot thought it was a masterpiece. Just loved loved Ulysses. Right. So yeah, they are talking with each other. They kind mm-hmm. of know each other. Some of them better than others. Um, and yeah, it's it's in the water. Then they've all just come out of World War One. You know, various experiences, but have kind of witnessed this devastating, very close um, in your face uh, war, and they're they're dealing with that in different ways in in their in these works mm-hmm. i think yeah absolutely um yeah thinking about the wasteland in particular you know when you just think about world war 1 specifically like you said it was one of the first times like the civil war there had been some pictures that had circulated to some degree but world war 1 was highly documented there was mm-hmm. all these new you know there was that weird mixture of like some soldiers were on horseback but there were like these rudimentary tanks and planes and all kinds of stuff so the dev- devastation that took place to the landscape was unlike anything that most people or probably anyone had ever seen. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, the trenches, trenches and you get those pictures of just dirt with like trees that are just, you know, burned and completely charred. And so, you know, that obviously factors into the wasteland a lot, but also the the waste of all the life, the, the youth, whether it was people that had spent years over there and, and were never the same, like we see later on in some of Virginia Woolf's you know, Mrs. Dalloway, some of the shell yeah. shock and things like that, or the literal wasting of life of all the death and everything like that. So, yeah. And then also, I think what's interesting too, with, you know, between the wasteland and Ulysses in particular, but, you know, um, Wolf does it too, is just where the, this modernist thing where they start to refer to like ancient texts mm-hmm. and they start to sprinkle things in often with, there's not a lot of, um, you know, there's not there's not a lot of warning. It'll just drop some of the stuff in, and they don't really yeah. give you, you know, a they life remove preserver. the scaffolding. <laughs> they remove the scaffolding. Yeah, you're just kind of on your own. And to some people, I know that's off putting, but I do think it has a lot to do with why one of the reasons why these works continue to kind of stick in your brain. You know, you can't mm-hmm. stop thinking about them because it's just it's mysterious. It's fascinating. It's historical. It feels really big and important because of that. So, yeah, there's a lot of those interesting trends that that I really enjoy. Just you can go back to this stuff. I hadn't read The Wasteland in years and going back to some of the phrases, they just give you the chills. And I don't know. Yeah. The work pays off if you want to do it. Now, I, I, I did a podcast on this a few years ago on 1922 and maybe maybe we'll i don't know maybe i'll put it up for patreon users because it's free for me just to pop it in there um where i went through these three books that we're talking about specifically ulysses jacob's room and the wasteland and i kind of said you know ulysses is not my favorite um book by james joyce i do think it's his greatest you know Mm. and jacob's room is certainly not my favorite book by uh, virginia wolf but she is on to something there and onto the shell shock and this absence of the sun, you know, it is a powerful story. Um, and the wasteland is maybe my favorite T.S. Eliot poem, but you know, there are others that are in there, Ash Wednesday. And then of course, proof rock are, mm-hmm. are ones that I really love. And, um, the four quartets, things like that. Those are, you know, it's hard for me to pick, but I do consider all of these to be fairly monumental and they are hard going in, in none of these would I sit down and just read them, you know, while I like out in the garden for a nice summer day read that I was just looking for some, some pleasure or even some deep thought because they, they require work to catch those references um, each and every one of them. And even just a, a lot of attention 
because they don't hold your hand while they're wandering around the towns or <clears throat> or in and out of different people's conscience consciousnesses. Yeah. It's tough to, you know, they talk about stream of conscience. Well, that's that's definitely here, which can sometimes make it difficult to know, you know, someone did someone just change that where they're looking, you know, are they mm-hmm. looking at the road now <laughs> rather than at something they're thinking about? Yeah, that could happen. But you can also quickly shift to someone else and start following that person. It's it's hard going, and I'm not going to say everybody needs to love it or, or like it. Um, sometimes I'm simply not in the mood, but when I have dug into these, it really has paid off, and I'm glad that they did it the way they did it. Um, yeah. I do think that they were masters at it. I don't think they stumbled on it. I think they were very thoughtful and careful and deliberate, and the results are are fantastic. And, and Virginia Woolf, I think, is just going to get better. Um, you know, I do not think the mooks and the gripes, you know, despite that being the name of this podcast, I do not think that um, Finnegan's Wake is that comprehensible or that, you know, maybe the work does not pay off in Finnegan's Wake <laughs> as it does in Ulysses. So Joyce, I think, hit his, hit his peak there. Mm-hmm. And um, again, probably T.S. Eliot's, uh, you know, great work of the wasteland. Um, but again, they did it often by removing the safeguards of literature, by you know, taking away that comfort. Uh, the Wasteland was different when he first was writing it. And then, you know, Ezra Pound, who's in every one of these people's heads as they're writing these, you know, talking about something that may affect everybody. The poet Ezra Pound was certainly on um, on these folks' minds and his thoughts. You know, he stripped that thing down, the Wasteland. Mm-hmm. And so you do have to do a lot more, a lot more work, um, and that sense of dislocation and of discomfort and of uncertainty, well, that's part of the point. You know, it's, know. it's pretty fantastic. It is. Yeah, I agree. And it's, I don't know, there's something about reading these. I remember reading some of these, you know, for the first time in a college classroom, The Wasteland in particular. <clears throat> and as a, as a student of literature, you know, you can get kind of smug about the past. Mm-hmm. You know, I think sometimes you can be like, you know, think things are old fashioned or safe. And I remember the wasteland in particular, and to some degree, the portrait portrait of an artist as a young man, like almost like a slap in the face. Like you thought you knew what the past <laughs> was like. And, you know, as far as like people staying within conventions or things, and it's kind of a good wake up call to just how dangerous literature can feel. And I don't know if that's too strong of a word, but that's how it feels to me. Like you don't know what's going on. They're taking risks. They're not, like you said, holding your hand. And And to me, that's, it's intimidating, but it's also very exciting. You know, sometimes you get tired of, Mm -hmm. you know, knowing what's coming next. And and some of these, you can read over some of these works and just let them, like we've talked about, wash over you. And that is a completely powerful, valid experience. But if you want to go back and reread, you could spend an entire lifetime, you know, digging through Ulysses and never get to the bottom of everything. You know, I had the, the big annotated version that I, (laughs) <laughs> used and I was trying to debate how to do it because if you wanted to if you wanted to look up every reference and chase every rabbit trail you know I would probably still be on page like 50 <laughs> even though I read it a couple of years ago so you kind of have to there's different ways you can approach it and I think that's exciting to you can go back and revisit these as many times as you want to and every single time you can take a different tact and you can discover mm-hmm. new things and it can be just as exciting in a different way so yeah and just as frustrating yeah, I will say that because I have read all of these uh, several times, in particular The Wasteland. And every time I read it, I think, okay, uh, where are the pegs I put into the, you know, to the mountain, the mountain wall last time right. that I can use to climb it this time? Oh, I'm on a different and, side of the mountain. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them have just vanished for some <laughs> reason, or yeah, I'm climbing up a different spot, and it's, you know, it's never an easy, easy, easy experience mm-hmm. to to scale that wall. Um, But I always like it. And I do think I'm getting better always, you know, it's almost like practice, Mm -hmm. practice reading the wasteland. (laughs) Yeah, no, for sure. And in the case of James Joyce, he's probably pulling out some of those pegs, like while you're not there. Yeah. yeah, Like laughing maniacally because he was definitely, he enjoyed, you know, deliberately wrong footing people and, and creating puzzles and things like that, which is kind of fun too. Well, let's look at some of the other books that came out that year. Um, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald 
1925 has a has a running for the greatest year ever because of the great gatsby but this is the year he published the beautiful and the damned uh mm-hmm. in 1922 and that's not a slouchy novel by any mm-hmm. means um you know and some other ones that i I've, I've not read edgar rice burroughs at the earth's core but you know i hear that has a lot to do with the wasteland no just kidding <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got willa cather one of ours which is one of hers that i have not read yet so i also can't comment on that um we've got colette's la maison du claudine um you know a lot is going on um we've got uh hesse's siddhartha you know, that's another big one um, for the year. And if we want to start talking about what maybe some of these people were reading in English for the first time, this was the first year that Proust, um, his In Search of Lost Time or Remembrance of Things Past, Volume 1, Swan's Way, published in English um, in 1922. Wow. You know, speaking of someone who was already doing a lot of this stuff before these, you know, English writers jumped in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of another one that was not an English writer that I came across that came out that year was um, Atugawa's um, story In a Bamboo Grove, which was published in 1922. And I guess it is best known as the main source of Kurosawa's film Rashomon. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So talk about doing interesting things in a different part of the world, but still looking at different ways of viewing one event, different perspectives, jumping in and out of different characters' minds. That's the way one of your psychology affects the way you view the, an event. Exactly. Hmm. So it's interesting that even across the world, you know, I don't know that there was, you know, I don't know enough about how how much interaction there was at that point, but there's similar things happening. Another one that came to mind for me that I thought was interesting um, that that came out that year was Sinclair Lewis's Babbitt. Have you ever read that one? I haven't read that one. Yeah, I read it. I didn't love it, but talk about an influential work where it starts focusing on some of the stuff that we still talk about today with just the workplace and kind of where you fit with that work-life balance. And, and you know, it's not, it's, I'll make a strange connection here, The Employees by Olga Round that I mentioned, that sci-fi story, an episode or two, or two ago that whole idea of where an employee fits within the bigger workplace. You know, I was, I stumbled across a piece by speaking of John self, our friend, John self looking at that book. And he was talking about how Babbitt has influenced so many books since then, like the man in the gray flannel suit, revolutionary road, um, Heller's something happened and even Brett Easton Ellis's American psycho. So big things were happening in 1922 that were going to ripple out for decades afterwards. Yeah. And I don't want to go too far without mentioning um, Catherine Mansfield. Mm -hmm. That was the year she published The Garden Party and other stories. It wasn't her first uh, collection, uh, but it was the last one. uh, Well, I think it was the last one she published in her lifetime. Um, Maybe The Dove's Nest came out before she died, but no, it couldn't have. She died on January 9th of 1923. And so The Dove's Nest came out in 23. But I'm I'm betting after she had she had passed away. Of course, several of those stories probably showed up, you know, at various publications mm-hmm. before that. But well, and I saw um, that she's actually she was friends with. It sounds like maybe Rocky friendship, but with Virginia Woolf as well. Um, and so it's interesting. It says they had a wobbly long term friendship, and um, <laughs> she was like friends with D. H. Lawrence and stuff too. But apparently, when Mansfield died, Virginia Woolf wrote in her diary. When I began to write, it seemed to me there was no point in writing. Catherine won't read it. Catherine's Mm -hmm. my rival no longer. Interesting. Yeah, it's just fascinating, all those connections. You brought up D.H. Lawrence, and I think Dorian, I don't know, would he be mad if we didn't bring up that this is the year he published both Aaron's Rod and England, My England, uh, his collection of stories? I think he would be mad, so he'd better mention it. uh, Dorian, I want to hear from you. Are these worth putting in there as making 1922 one of the best years. I've read some of Lawrence's short stories, but I don't know if they were the ones in England, my England. And I don't know much about Aaron Gerard, but I know you probably do. So I want to hear it. Mm-hmm. Is that is that just another thing to throw in here? And I, my favorite book of last year, Paul, that I read last year, Elizabeth Von Arnhem's The Enchanted April, 1922. Ooh. Just, you know, in the midst of all of this depression of the wasteland <laughs> we have this glorious spring of sunshine and flowers and love and l i i adored this book and that's a 1922 book so not all doom and gloom 
<laughs> and, and in that discussion on a more optimistic note for sure yeah well and, and someone else who's doing some kind of maybe a mixture of the two we've got a lot of stories from stefan zweig that came out in 1922 um amok for example and um maybe my favorite of his letter from an unknown woman you know just mm. some fun and really you know compelling um plots, <laughs> yeah. psychological stories and such. Not do, not everyone was doing what Wolf and Elliot, uh, you know, were doing and, and James Joyce. There was a lot going on in this year. And I kind of think it, I read a lot of articles preparing for today. Now, 1922 is often called, you know, the start of modernism because of Ulysses, even right. though it kind of isn't. It's like there's the marker in the sand. Um, there are a lot of books about 1922. I don't think I'm just parroting them. None of the other years that were put up as as contenders felt the same to me. No. You know, they all had good books, but it's hard for me to look at them and say, that's the best. You know, the BBC um, put 1925 as their, you know, the best year. And I'm like, well, yeah, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway and The Great Gatsby. And there are a few others, John Dos Passos. You know, there, there are some other books that come out that year, but I'm like, I don't uh, know. I mean, Ulysses and the Wasteland alone kind of make 1922 big. And then you start adding all these other ones in there. And it's hard to, it's hard for me to say that they, you know, the great Gatsby, which I love and Mrs. Dalloway, which is probably my favorite or, you know, maybe my second favorite uh, Virginia Woolf novel. It's hard for me to say those carry can carry 1925 quite the way that these other books carry 1922. Yeah. No, I agree. I could not find any, I could find contenders, but I think to me, 22 would be the clear, the clear champion if we're doing a ranking. Cause like you said, either the wasteland or Ulysses by themselves. I mean, that is so monumental. And then you start throwing in so many of these other ones. And like you said, even if it wasn't Virginia Woolf's greatest book necessarily, it was where she started to turn that corner, which was leading to some of her greatness too. So now I'm with you. 1922 seems, seems like it has not been trumped yet that I, that I've seen. So can I just throw in one quick addendum about Ulysses? Um, yeah. If anybody wants to do more reading about kind of the history of it, I listened to an audiobook of this book called the most dangerous book, the battle mm-hmm. for James <laughs> Joyce's Ulysses back. It came out in 2015. It's by Kevin Birmingham. And I thought that was fascinating. A lot of the stuff I knew, you know, it's just kind of become, you know, history, but there's a lot of, details and and fascinating things in that book that give you a really good background of, of a lot of what we've talked about today, including some of the Virginia Woolf stuff, but a whole lot else with Shakespeare and company and how it was published and how it was banned and all those different things. So I would highly recommend if anybody's interested, give that a try. Yeah. The things he had to go through to get it published on wow. his 40th birthday. Yeah, seriously. And and only in, in France because... None of the English speaking countries would publish it. <laughs> well, the risks people took of, you know, it's almost like a spy story. Sometimes people smuggling it across and, you know, putting Postal it in their... workers yeah. uh, uh, burning it. Is... <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Crazy. Oh. Well, fun stuff, Paul. Thanks for that conversation, for indulging me. Oh, I don't know fun. if we'll do one in 2023, looking back on 1923. <laughs> Maybe we yeah. can go back to 1623 or you you know, 1723. We'll have to look and see what, what Expand our anniversaries are there. <laughs> um, I do have one recommendation as we step away from the episode and get into that. This past week, I was delighted that our good friends, uh, Rebecca and Dorian and Francis, who showed up on our podcast, uh, Francis was in, I think, episode eight. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they released their first episode of their new podcast, One Bright Book. And it's delightful. I can't wait to hear all the rest of these these um, three of our friends have to say. Um, I was delighted by the theme music that they chose. Mm-hmm. And, and only at the end did they say that it was uh, written by Owen, uh, written and well composed and performed by Owen Mateson, mm-hmm. um, Rowan's son, and uh, my heart to them all. Um, but I, I thought this was a really great way to, to show his music. And I, I loved it before I knew it was his. <laughs> I know, I did too. Yeah, it's beautiful. But congratulations on the debut episode. I did listen to it. You guys definitely assuaged um, some of my vague uh, disappointment. You know, that. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. Speaking of great minds, think alike. Um, that was going to be my recommendation too. Well, I kind of wondered, so yeah, I thought I'd no. take it. I'd take a jump this time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, anybody. I would assume that a lot of our listeners have probably already come across it, but anybody who hasn't, you should definitely subscribe, add it to your list. It is one episode in. It was kind of their introductory episode. It was yeah. absolutely delightful. They talked about some great literature, tons of great books. So they're going to add even more to your TBR pile. Yeah. Which is, Beware. Elena Beware. knows. I got to get that book now for sure. I know. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And yeah, they have such great taste. I kind of jokingly said that they were each listening, listing their five favorite books. And I thought that Dorian's would just be five copies of Marion Ingalls bear, but he, he branched out <laughs> and actually added four other books. So yeah, no, but <laughs> can't wait for the next Francis step. wouldn't let him do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks his, Francis. <laughs> got his wrist slapped and we'll see how long Dorian can keep their clean rating too. I'll be curious about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's lots of fun. And I know that in their first episode, they're going to be talking about Susan Sontag's book yeah. the volcano lover so yeah. can't wait to hear about that because she's one that i have been circling for years but have yet to dive in so yeah absolutely yeah that'll be fun thanks guys for doing that and um good luck on your launch we will mm-hmm. certainly be listening absolutely so much fun all right paul that's our episode i believe today yeah. thanks for showing up again i can't wait till next time we get together we're talking jane austen um, bring some tea and, uh, and we'll have a delightful conversation yeah. and we're with a lot of a... little barbs, you know, thrown, thrown exactly. back and forth. There'll be know. some undercurrents running through it. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> well, and you know, as, as long as everything goes according to plan, we're also going to have a little addendum to that episode mm-hmm. with a special guest, which I'm really excited about, um, which everybody should tune in for that. Cause she's, she's delightful and, and very knowledgeable and she's going to add some some really exciting insights into Jane Austen as well. I'll just leave that for the teaser, but yeah, definitely want to check that out. Fun. All right. Well, thanks everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. You can follow the Mooks and the Gripes and get show notes and book and film reviews at mooksandgripes.com. On Twitter, you can find Trevor at Mooks and Paul at BiblioPaul. You can also get information about future shows on our Patreon. If you'd like to donate to the show, anything and everything, even a dollar a month, helps and is deeply appreciated. You can become a patron at patreon.com mooks. Until next time.